All right. I will call the September Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Uh, thank everyone for attending. Uh, a very busy agenda today. Uh, starting at 11 a.m. Uh, after our board meeting, there will be a public uh, hearing for the 2020 annual plan, which because of the COVID we had to postpone, which usually happens back in March. Uh, because of the safety protocols in place due to the COVID pandemic, uh, including limitation on public gatherings and social distancing, today's public hearing will take place over the board net's virtual platform. Uh, Kim Thomas, our housing program director, will give an overview and presentation on the annual plan public hearing process. Uh, and then we will be talking uh, about uh, if there are public comments, whether you're on the phone, press star three. If you're on your computer, see the message box uh, on your screen. Um, and we'll go over that again as we get closer to the public hearing. Um, additionally, uh, over the past couple of weeks, there have been a number of significant criminal events within our communities. The increase in crime is a major concern to all of us. And today, uh, we as commissioners will voice our concerns and possible strategies going forward. Um, to help us gain a better understanding of natures of these events, uh, we will be talking with uh, Sergeant Dixon and Chief Boone. Uh, unfortunately, due to prior commitments, they could not make today's meeting. However, they are tentatively scheduled to appear at our October meeting. So therefore, I invite your comments, if any, on the meetings from the August 13th Board of Commissioners meeting. Any comments, commissioners? I uh, have a couple. Uh, the first one is, uh, and maybe there will be room to report this. Uh, uh, very, very uh, soon, I had a meeting with the safety, uh, public health and safety team uh, on, uh, was it last Friday on? I think it was last Friday. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we, we, I think we had uh, achieved a uh, at least a partial strategy uh, that will help improve broaden the stakeholders. That's what uh, my comments to the team were, and they were very receptive. And even in uh, attempting some things that had been done in the past, one of the things I shared with the team was. Give the report now anyway on a, I'll wait until it comes to me, but we had a good meeting. Okay. Uh, I thought it was a very good meeting. And we had some good ideas, uh, some of which I discussed with my partner, uh, uh, Suzanne. We had a, another commitment. It wasn't at the meeting, but I, when I briefed her, I told her what we were going to try to do. And then I uh, also discussed it later with Joe, Joe Dillard, who uh, I was going to try to solicit his help. And, Putting a message in it, man. So yeah. uh, I'll speak a little bit. And then the other thing I want to say is uh, I think uh, our executive director had uh, some a family situation that really challenged him. I think it was relative to your sister, wasn't it, Ron? And, and uh, just I don't know if we have publicly said, I know the board members have uh, certainly expressed. Uh, uh, their heartfelt, uh, extended feelings toward you and your family, and uh, and so on behalf of those of us that hadn't weighed in yet, uh, I just wanted you to know that uh, we are here to fully support you and your family, and uh, we all know the things that are critically important in life, and it began right in that initial circle of people that uh, we come into the world with. So uh, bless you as uh, you go forward, whatever the condition of your family, we're praying for you. Thank you. Other comment? Yes, Rose. Um, I would like to thank uh, Ron and Donald because we've had some challenging things come up this past month with uh, our communities. And um, they have addressed them well. 
um, one of the I remember one of the residents uh, just couldn't get in her place, and it was it was a do or die situation that needed to be done, and they moved forward on it that same day, and that same she was in her place, and I want to thank you all for doing that as needed. Uh, any other comments on the minutes? If not, I'll entertain the motion to approve. So moved. A second? Second. Lawrence? Robert? Aye. Ms. Perrier? Aye. Mr. Vanessa? Aye. Mr. Dillard? Aye. Mr. Misachi? Aye. Okay, well then we'll move on next to the executive director's comments. Huh? Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, I had a, just a couple of updates. Uh, on the last meeting, I update you all on, uh, it was before we actually had the, got the program off the ground. I was the CARES Relief or our Housing Cost Release Pro Relief Program that we had uh, received money from the city that they had received from the, their part of the CARES Act, and that was money that we were direct to uh, citizens of Norfolk with certain income, there was income requirement, like 98,000 for sole owner, 198,000 for combined. Uh, they had the property had to be in, in Norfolk. They couldn't also be receiving any other assistance that would provide housing assistance. So we started that program uh, uh, August 31. Uh, that first day we had received uh, 79 applications for housing assistance. And over the next couple of days, it was uh, up to 247 uh, applications, and these are all online. We had our, we had a really good team of folks that worked to really meet the deadline, make sure the applications were accessible online. We did a lot of marketing, uh, uh, had a lot of uh, information out on our website. Uh, so as of yesterday, we had 375 applications. Now we haven't gotten to the point of actually being able to approve any. Yet, so we want to be able to hopefully be able to report out how many applications we'll be able to approve and how much actual funds of the two million dollars in this first phase that's available. We want to be able to report that out. But as of yesterday, around ten, we had three hundred seventy-five applications. We had about forty-five hundred page views. I know there have been a, no a number of impressions that we've had on social media, so there appears to be a lot of interest in the program and our goal is to act to make sure that we get the money out as soon as possible and i know it was a lot more important because at that time the only sort of uh, we had a number of moratorium eviction uh, evictions on moratorium i'm sorry moratorium on eviction since the since march and at the time uh, i think the last one that was in effect was the state one which ended the seventh but as of the 1st of uh, September, the CDC uh, had uh, passed the, uh, there's a imposed a moratorium eviction from uh, September 1 through the end of the year. And so that, uh, the basis of that being that if evictions were allowed to proceed, that it would help spread or increase the spread of the coronavirus. So it's basically based upon a public health uh, situation why they why they imposed the this federal CDC uh, moratorium on evictions and the same same thing applies it doesn't absolve anyone's responsibility for paying rent but one of the things that they did uh, that they did do is they provided what they call it it's like a, dec a declaration uh, that each resident that this applies to the same uh, i mentioned that, that the same income category applies and when i talked about the cares and also for the stimulus payment the sole owner ninety-eight thousand, dual uh 198 is that this applies to to those families so there's a declaration that the cdc uh put in place and, and basically the uh, uh the, the resident family, they have to attest to a number of items. For example, as it says that you as the as the resident, 
have used their best efforts to obtain all available government assistance for housing. And there's another uh, bullet uh, which talks about the income guidelines. You have to test that you meet the income guidelines. And that you also have to say that you, uh, you're unable to pay full rent or make full housing payment due to, due to substantial loss because of the coronavirus. You've used your best efforts to make, even if you, even if it's partial payments, you've done made your best effort to do that. And you've also have to attest to the fact that if evicted, you will become homeless. And uh, then the last thing being that they understand that once this period ends, which would be uh, December 31, 2020, that the landlord or mortgage company, whatever, they have the right to pursue whatever means they have to, to obtain whatever balance of uh, rent or mortgage that, have, that hasn't been paid. So, Ron, do you expect any more uh, applicants? Excuse me? Do you expect any more applicants beyond 375? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, we, we expect a little, I mean, it was, I think it, we did, we may have seen the, the peak. Uh, we anticipated when we started the program that we'd be able to help about 128 families just based upon some of the local data in terms of the, like the jobless claims and things like that. We thought, but it, it, it appears that there's a lot more need out there. And we're, we're expecting to go through uh, this first phase and that possibly there, be, maybe there may be a second phase as well. Um, well, this the, the amount of applicants divided by the two million bucks, about five thousand bucks a person. That can cover a lot of rent. Yeah, it can cover. That can do a lot of good. Yeah. unless the it, pool is too big. Right. So we between between that, the, the rent, uh, mortgage, or utilities, also. So I think we'll go through that pretty quickly. Okay. And, and the, the most important thing that even for our residents, we just want to make sure that. Just because the moratorium's in place that people don't get relax. And I know in our case, we're not imposing any late fees or things like that, but I think under the CDC moratorium, landlords can still assess those type of fees, but as a housing authority, we're choosing not to do that. So, um, but anyway, um, Mike Clark's gonna be given a, 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 a more of an overview on, on the program, but I just wanted to give you an update to as to where we are in terms of the metrics of the program. Uh, but one of the, uh, another update that I wanted to bring to your attention is the retreat. I know we had talked about having a retreat uh, for the past couple months, and I'd like to thank uh, Kathy Mosley, our procurement director. She was able to obtain uh, Dr. Janice Sanchez for, uh, for a retreat. Uh, logistics, and I'll just give you, well, before I start, I'll just give you a, a background for, for y'all who don't well, know her, because I know a couple of commissioners have had the opportunity to be in retreats that she facilitated. But uh, Dr. Sanchez, is a, she's a retired professor of psychology at ODU, uh, Ogden University. She has a private practice who teaches and lectures on African-American mental health issues. She's also taught undergraduate and graduate Courses related to clinical psychology, personality development, psychology, psychology of women, African American psychology, and psychodynamic therapy. So, what uh, in terms of the logistics, what we're looking at is October. Uh, and now these the sessions are going to have to be in person. So we we thought that maybe two, three hours at the most sessions would work and what what I was gonna do is have Phyllis reach out to you all and see what dates, two dates would work in, in October. So that'll probably be, uh, I know Phyllis is off, so that'll probably be the early part of next week. She'll reach out to you all and talk about, uh, try to solidify a couple of days. And, that, and that's initially, there may be some, you know, some follow-up with that, but that's what we're looking at in October. Okay, I think that'll be fine. Okay, okay that'll be fine. Okay. And, uh, and also, there, there will be some information uh, that will be forthcoming from Dr. Sanchez and information from me in terms of, I think, some things that will help facilitate the discussion, more, especially when we start talking about the organization, uh, the profile of the organization, 
you know, some information that will help in terms of how your dialogue and some of your decisions will help impact the organization. So we'll make sure that you have that information before we actually go into the retreat. And the last thing I just wanted to talk about that I think Don and Alfonso talked about, touched on was increasing crime that we've experienced. Um, I know that uh, and I talked, and I know I specifically talked with uh, with Rose on, uh, on a number of occasions about that, and we talked about some of the things that we probably, as an organization, need to do in terms of. Uh, I know that you know with COVID, it, it's kind of hard. You know, ordinarily under circumstances, at least what I'm accustomed to, when you have situations where you have spike in crime, it's always good to be able to go out and you have like neighborhood watch meetings and sort of remind the residents that, hey, you know, we can't be everywhere at once, but you guys are going to have to help us in terms of, you know, letting us know what's going on in the community, sort of report things so that we could at least direct our attention to certain things that are going on that we may not be aware of. And also, I think that we have an obligation in terms of communicating, uh, especially, you know, we have, you know, gun owners and things within our community. And just from some of the significant events that I sent out, you can see that these are sort of this ordinary disputes that are being settled by using using guns. Is it, is it permissible for one of our residents to own a gun? And, uh, yes. yes, it is. Is that federal law? I won't vote against that. I won't vote against that. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they, uh, because we had uh, our security officer, uh, Karen, uh, Karen talk about uh, uh, going to, you know, going to, I guess there have been altercations and their, their residents and others walking around with, you know, with weapons that they could, you know, they could, that they're visible. But in the past, we've had this situation come up, right? And historically, they're happening in our neighborhoods, but adopted that on our records. Yes, like what happened yes, in Hunter yes, Square yeah. and the little girl was shot. Yeah. Yes. The person that took that trigger was not from Hunter Square. They're looking for him now, but yeah. if, we, if we have to watch our messaging, if we keep telling this board that it is our residence, when it's people coming from Chesapeake that are in our neighborhood. Okay. Yes, yeah, some of these other, okay. but like some of these, like other, some of these yeah. domestic things that we hear uh, about the Within, within our units, some of them are, are residents. Now, I don't know about, I know that, I think Rose had mentioned something to me about the, the one shooting, things of Lexington Heights. I think she had mentioned to me that some possible connection between our, 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 rep, our gangs in, in that particular situation. But, uh, but I know that they have, you're right. There, there are some have been outside, but then there's also some within our communities. They're not said just domestic disputes. So we had talked about possibly sending out communications in terms of for the ones that have that are going on in our community that we talk about more. Recently. Really, just it, a lot of it comes down to even just being able to handle domestic situations, disputes, and things like that, and just not ordinarily not automatically jumping to, you know, resolving disputes using weapons or even violence. Yes. So, Ron, I'm, I'm still trying to understand. I, understand. I knew that you had to have a gun, if you had a gun and it showed, you had to have a license for it. So, really, now you don't. You still, you still have to have a license for it. You still have a permit. Well, it depends on the situation, Ms. Arrington, but there is a right to have guns. now. Some people chose to have uh, licenses to conceal carry, which is a different situation. I'm not aware of the specifics in the situations that um, we've experienced recently, but generally speaking, yes, our residents, it's like any American citizen, any resident in the United States, have the right for the Constitution to bear arms. You can't smoke, but they can bear arms. <laughs> Did I, did I read where the city of Richmond just passed a city ordinance that says that you cannot have a gun on city property to include sidewalks? Mm -hmm. That was just passed this week. That's, that's for everyone. We're, what we're doing, which I think we should highly consider this conversation, 
talking about the secular people, mainly poor African Americans, and trying to disarm them. What Richmond did was the city says, you can't have a gun on our property at all. Like the city of Nova, when they say, you can't bring a gun in the city council, you can't be nasty. Joe Dillard, or the President of the United States, that's totally different than we're saying, okay, if you're on our property and you can't have a weapon. You know, I, I think what Rose is saying, you're talking about open carry. Open and that's carry. Open, open carry, carry. And you don't need a fight whatsoever. I think that's a fine line. Okay. As a board, you just need to be conscious of the fine line of arming and disarming the citizens that we serve. That can get really much really quick. Um, I think it's a lot of things going on here, a lot of things going on. But the real problem is the games. And just like um, Don said, we need to really get someone to come in and talk about it so we we'll know what's going on but right now. We don't know what game, because I know one game is in, a lot of games in Calvary and Young, and they're bickering back and forth. But we need someone to come in and really talk to us about it so we don't know where we're going. But right now, we don't know where we're going. We just know it's games out there. And they may have taken over the communities. I agree with you 100%. And I think uh, Chief Boone coming in next month is going to help us out with this because this has always been an issue. I think in our community, and one thing that I think, other than, oh, let's take the guns out of the community, I think Chief Boone's going to share some statistics. You guys remember the guy that was shot downtown North for throwing a gun on the roof, Isaiah Swift? Mm -hmm. The day before, it was video of him walking in Superior Pond and having a straw purpose. And that's the issue. Yeah. You can go to Bob's gun right now from Young's Park. I can give you for $500, Ken. There's no repercussions or repercussions for what Bob's guns for selling you a gun and coming outside handed. That's where we're going to really focus on something. And I think Bowman is, when he comes here, he's going to talk about that too. It's not necessarily guns in, in the games in those, it's the access to those. Yeah. You know, so, okay. okay. I'll make one more comment. Um, Rose, one of the things that I was uh, very adamant with our safety team with is we have to find a way to get the community to be yep. an equal partner. And, this because it does nothing for us if when things do happen we can't get support from the people who live there and so having the community as a stakeholder the same way we are same way the community needs to hold us accountable we need to find a way to bring the communities in as stakeholders so that and that's where the critical information is gathered uh i mean above and beyond who's got what because if i have a concealed weapon and walk on the property. I didn't do as much damage if I have bad intentions. And so oftentimes, the community knows who is walking around with a concealed weapon. Am I right? Yes. And so uh, we, we really need to get the community on board as a stakeholder and, uh, and, and, and have them appreciate that. Together, we're going we're gonna to bring this puppy home. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. 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 Yes. Okay. Commissioner, comment. Uh, again, I do think it's important, and that we uh, make sure that we do have that meeting next month with the chief and uh, Sergeant Dixon, uh, because it is getting to a very noticeable level way above what you would anticipate just in a city this size. So it's very important. And I also know that Chief Boone is very metric oriented as far as putting out his resources. And so that's what we need to really talk to him about is uh, having that particular piece, as Alfonso and Rose have said, and others, having that piece not be the only thing that happens. Enforcement isn't the only thing. So, uh, but again, I think we'll we'll have that discussion in uh, October. Other comments, Commissioner? All right, then we'll go ahead and move on to, uh, also if you have your agenda here with the page numbers on it, it'll be on page 19, uh, which we'll have, uh, I'll call up Michael Clark to talk to us about uh, Resolution for the uh, 
Church of God in Christ High Rise Park. Michael. Maybe the hot mic. <laughs> Our, our bond council is presenting that. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Kevin White, yeah. Ben? Yeah, Hi, this Kevin. is Kevin White. Um, if you, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so I apologize for not being able to be there in person today. Um, you have before you a final approving resolution for the uh, bond financing of the Kojic Memorial Home for the Elderly. Um, previously, we've held a public hearing with the authority um, on June 25th, and uh, uh, the authority provided uh, initial approval to the assisting the conduit issuer for the for the developer in the home. Um, and uh, now we are closer to closing. We have the borrower has. Um, a term sheet with Cedar Rapid Bank and Trust, which will uh, purchase the bonds. And we have a bond financing agreement that's in the process of being negotiated. Um, your counsel, Delphine Carnes, and her uh, partners have uh, been active in reviewing and commenting on the documents. So we feel it's appropriate at this time that for final approval of the transaction. Uh, we believe it will close within the next 60 days. Um, so the resolution just would authorize your officers to sign um, final agreements that have been approved by your council and, uh, you know, assist with um, facilitating the closing. Um, again, the, the resolution similar to the inducement resolution that was passed previously, uh, specifies that the bonds are not an obligation of the city or the authority, but they're passed through obligations of the borrower and that um, the authority has no um, liability for payment of service. Uh, available to answer any questions you may have. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, um, would appreciate if you would consider approving the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Again, you can see the uh, resolution itself and then the actual wording that Kevin has talked about with the, uh, as to exactly what would, the key is. And Delphine, any comments? Um, no, sir. Again, this is. Um... A pass through or conduit issuance. There is no liability to the housing authority or the city of Norfolk for the repayment of the bonds. Actually, this is beneficial to the authority in a number of ways. Of course, you're receiving an annual fee for your role as the issuer of the bonds, and this also promotes um, the renovation of the Kojic apartments, which is beneficial to the city of Norfolk and very consistent with the mission of the housing authority. The comments or questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. A second? Second. Ms. Carnes? Mr. Albert? I abstain. Ms. Harrington? Aye. Ms. Perrier? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Mr. Dillard? Aye. Mr. Musashio? Aye. All right, thank you. Uh, now again, we'll look at, I guess, Michael, are you going to do uh, the <laughs> consolidated? Yes, good morning. Very much. Good morning. And that would be on page 25. Uh, good morning again, commissioners. Um, we're here to talk about resolution authorizing amendment number three to the uh, capital budget for the COVID relief program. <laughs> Our executive director pretty much said everything I was going to say, so I'll just touch on a few things. Um, we are actually in, uh, as Ron said, there are two phases. We're actually in phase one now. That utilizes the uh, two million, uh, that's going to utilize two million from the Commonwealth. Um, 
the actual cutoff, it started, Ron mentioned it started on the 31st. The cu application cutoff, the deadline for receiving new applications is actually on September 13th. Um, if someone has an application in by the 13th, but they don't have all their documents, you have up until the 20th to get those in. The goal is to spend all of that money by the 30th. As far as the application count, I mean, they're, they're still coming in daily. The first couple of days, it was a peak, but we're still averaging anywhere from 10 to 15 new applications a day. I would anticipate by the end of the day, if we're not there already, we're, we're over 400 applications. So I, I, we're moving good on that. And um, I'll just take a moment to say, I like to thank communications and IT for getting the word out. I don't know if any of you saw LaShawn Forts on um, the Coast Live yesterday, but- I did. Good. She did a great job. Yes, too. she did. And so I'd like to give a shout out to her for getting the word out. And also Rebecca Burris, who was very instrumental in working with LaShawn, and she is now as far as getting the application process and actually the lady right, right out there at the desk, Elaine, she's working on the applications too. So we're, we're trying to get to that first closing. Uh, admittedly, some of the applications are coming in somewhat piecemeal, but that's somewhat to be expected. So again, the first round is in place now, and we have to be expended by uh, the 30th of uh, December. Phase two, which there is a phase two, that actually starts um, January 4th. And very similar to phase one, they both address housing needs, whether it's rent, mortgage, utilities, but in addition at all for, for phase two, the difference is if, because it's CD money that's utilized in phase two, that taps, that brings you into the um, area median income guidelines. So you're not necessarily uh, hitting the same uh, income group. The, the key to it though is 70% uh, of the applicants have to be at 80 or under area median income, but 30% can be in that 80 to 120. So we're still capturing a lot of people in that. And uh, the need will most likely still be there at that time. Um, the resolution that we're bringing to you today is authorizing an increase of $3,309,385, which is actually the 2 million, in that 2 million for phase one, and also the additional monies for phase two. And we're hoping that you adopt the resolution. Any any additional questions or Michael? yes? Um, is there a admin? Um, yes, that's covered. In, in there as yes, well yes. That time and yes, it is. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right, then I'll entertain a motion to approve. I'll make a motion. A second. Second. Collins? Mr. Albert? I, I abstain, but I need to uh, clarify this. My uh, laptop can't get the internet. I couldn't download it. I have made it a practice my entire public life that anything I have to vote on or authorize, I have to read thoroughly. Since I can't read it, I abstain. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for that. Ms. Harrington? Ms. Perrier? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Mr. Dillard? Yes, sir. If I'm active in the lobby, so there's a two hours thing, or can I vote for it? No, you can still vote for it. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And I think as the chair and I spoke earlier this morning, and he was going to allow me to do the uh, development activities report now, and if there are any questions, but I did want to highlight one thing in your. That's on, excuse me, Mike. Yes. That's on, starts on page thirty-seven. I did want to highlight that we, uh, and I think I said Commissioner Benassi and also Commissioner Gresham was not here. A brief uh, heads up that we did put out the Ocean View infill. RFP and that we are reviewing now uh, nine uh, submissions for the nine lots. In the update, 
I mentioned that our land sales projection, we figured about 650,000. When I did this, that was the number. Looking at it again yesterday, we're looking at about 745,000 worth of land sale proceeds coming in. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, with any other questions? Or is, there, is there any uh, uh, deducts out of that? Or is that just cash flow coming in? That's cash flow coming in to us. And to, to, just again, were there requests on all of the properties? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Okay, on yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll get rid of every lot in that RFP. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, then I'll move on to page 28. Your Look, and then ask uh, Nat to come on. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Good. Good morning. The uh, issue in question is a resolution to authorize uh, five hundred thousand dollars to support improvements to the City View Tower, which is the five fifty five East Main Building. NRHA has been in occupancy for a little over four years now, and we've been owners of the building for approximately two and a half years. When we, shortly after we closed on the property in March of 2018, we undertook uh, about $650,000 of immediate uh, repairs that were mostly code and safety related items. So for instance, the uh, automatic doors at the front of the building for access and to our client uh, services space, uh, lots of accessibility and bathrooms that were not handicapped accessible, uh, putting extra uh, protection on the handrails for the fire stairs so they met current code. Uh, and when that work was complete, we started on uh, what, what we called the phase two work, which was design for additional items that had been identified in, in the due diligence process uh, that were more extensive, uh, less urgent, but still important and uh, our consulting architects completed that work about a year ago. It came with an estimate of about two and a half million dollars. And at the time we were already experiencing a higher than anticipated vacancy rate in the building. Uh, so that has reduced available funds for improvements. And we were told at the time by Mr. Konak to prioritize items and limit the spending to $500,000. That was authorized by you all uh, last February. Uh, <laughs> and then a month later, the, the world changed. So I, I regret to say that we did not succeed in expending any of that uh, in the past fiscal year. So this is really a request to reauthorize the $500,000 to complete the most urgent of these repairs uh, as soon as we can and, and certainly in the upcoming year. Uh, most of you are on site, so uh, you are probably very familiar with what, what's the, the biggest piece of this is repairs to the garage uh, floor slabs, which have a lot of uh, divots, rusted rebar has uh, displaced concrete and, and created some uh, divots and, and holes in the slab. That is a very important uh, item to correct. Uh, and we do have bids for that right now. Uh, and there are other items in the garage, and then, as I said, some, some miscellaneous things like electrical and mechanical system repairs, and we would limit expenditures to the $500,000.
let me stop there, and I'm happy to take any specific questions. Questions, comments? Okay, then uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. A second? Second. Second. Mr. Albert? I'm staying. Ms. Arrington? Aye. Ms. Perrier? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Mr. Dillard? Aye. Mr. Musacchio? Aye. Nat, I don't know if you heard my last comment, but I'm abstaining not because I don't uh, like the idea of the resolution. I just can't read it because I don't yes, have, sir. My, have not been able to download it. So, uh, you know, I know if you get too upset with me, you'll sit there on there. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> <You're getting to laughs> hey, hey, Ron, what, what time? At what point should we discuss our discussions yesterday? So this is probably okay. yeah, I think probably so. a good time yeah. to talk about some. We had, uh, had a discussion yesterday uh, looking at looking at the long term uh, of the property. Well, first addressing some of the short term things which involve the, the rents, but then looking at the sort of the, the long term plan for the uh, for this property, which. Uh, Really, it was probably uh, like Ken has brought up. That was uh, part of uh, John's long-term plan for the building it was the use of uh, historic tax credits to help reposition the property. Uh, so those are some of the things we had we had talked about. Uh, just coming up with some ideas that to be able to present to the board. I think that that's probably the more probably more. Uh, Practical approach in terms of repositioning the property. And I was going to try to get some preliminary information on the long term, uh, in terms of positioning the property. And uh, and that's pretty much what we have. Yeah, let me make a couple of comments. Yeah. First of all, my data says our vacancy rate is 37% in this building. And I'm not sure which one is which, but it is, uh, that's not good. That is by far the worst of any building in town, uh, downtown. Um, I think we're able, I think Ron has been able to uncover a few things that take some of the sting out of this, whereas we were probably miscalculating the rents that we were allowed to charge. It's complicated as, as, as uh, Asian arithmetic, but it's, it's it involves charging because we have, we have our public housing and, and Section 8 operations programs in this building and you know all housing authorities they don't own their buildings and they usually rent so the government puts a they put regulations on how much rent can be charged to these programs and like I said that most housing authorities don't they usually in the building and most of the housing authorities have been we've been in the building with other tenants and so there's only a certain certain a limit on the kinds of rent you can't charge these programs for profit. So you can only charge for cost. So yes, and, and, and what, what Ron's saying is there's a formula that the government forces us to use that's based around our expenses. Yeah. Well, we were making a mistake. We weren't using the most the largest expense we had, which was interest. And Ron has rectified that. And why does that mean anything? Because it's it's all coming in and out of our pocket. Yeah. It's, it's we're chewing up reserves by any uh, shortages we have, and we're not able to charge back the program, various programs. So right. this is getting accounting back on a better foot. Yeah, and I was going to say uh, what that also does is money that would be going out uh, to somebody else with no return now comes back. But you all know I live in the nonprofit world. And space is at a premium, uh, and nonprofits, some of the ones that are not necessarily huge, uh, are looking for a space that's as centralized downtown, especially for their right. uh, home office operations. Not necessarily, you know, 
the outreach and the field work. And I think there's a market out there that we may not be tapping into. I could be wrong. It's not my field. It's your field. But, but uh, I think that there's a market that we're not capturing. 63% occupancy rate is horrendous. I can't, you can't even buy a solar pot and not be in the game. We're, we, we're taking a look at uh, I even reached out to the city just to let them know, you know, because they're, right. they're, you know, as much as they're expanding and they have operations throughout you know, different parts of the city. So I, I did approach them on that if there's any opportunities there. We also looking at, you know, we're looking at other things maybe uh, in terms of maybe we need a, a more forceful representation in terms of attracting tenants. So we're, we're looking at everything. Yeah. No, 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 I wouldn't suggest you weren't. All I'm saying is oh, yeah. that, that uh, and I guess the management company is responsible for the market. Uh, so no, it's still so on us. No, there's, Ooh, two no. Se there's two separate companies. So you have to hire a marketing company. That is well, we have a marketing company, but but we'll have to review all that. No, 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 I'm asking functionally who, who, who does that. Well, I think Jones Lang LaSalle is your yeah. leasing agent. And then we have your is your the property manager. The property manager. Okay, yeah, so, 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 two so the reason I said that is because, like, our second chances office mm -hmm. are in City Hall. And we pay rent for the last four or five months and not been able to get into the building. I mean, the staff can go in. They say, well, your staff can come in because they got ideas. Well, they can't turn time. Well, they, you know, I mean, they can do take management from anywhere. And so, uh, I, I just, I just wanted to let you know there may be a market out there that, if yeah. even if it was just one floor, uh, you know, or well, 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 please know this is a very big item in our budget, and what Ron and, and fortunately Ron does have some experience with this historic tax credit program. This is very very lucrative potentially. However, we have a long runway to get there. Okay. And so we've got to watch the, the monies that we're spending on this building. We got to do it parsimoniously. And we have to, Rob, there's some specifics here. I would tell you that when we look at historic tax credits, structural stuff is not a qualifying expense. So we ought to be spending money like on concrete repairs yes, now. Yeah. Because it is, it's, it's the non-structural stuff or property acquisition that is qualifiable expense. So there's a real science to doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm putting my money on can. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's that's, that's, <laughs> that's it. Any product yeah. estimated for me. Yeah, I'm going to put through this. Uh, bad. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, there's things we need to take up currently. We're working out the, the rent situation, which gets into this whole uh, the whole thing with the uh, debt coverage ratio. So there's a, a number of things that we are, we are addressing those, and that could be part of the, the larger discussion we have with the long term. Yeah, and I've asked Ron to put together kind of a table and maybe our next meeting, because this is really complicated stuff, but it's big, big money, and I want you to see where the impacts are and what the planning is and the impacts. Yeah. Good, good. We'll put it on the agenda then. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Other comments? All right, then I'll ask uh, Steve Morales to talk to us about the return policy, which is on page 30. Steve? Good morning, board members. Yes, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yes. All right, uh, so before the board today is a resolution to adopt the return policy for the CNI project. This return policy really memorializes the Tidewater residents' right to return. Uh, the policy will apply to Tidewater residents that were lease compliant as of February 28, 2019, and who remain lease compliant um, throughout their, their relocation. Um, the right of return is, is, is going to be accomplished by providing a first preference to the new replacement unit, um, um, and then also a first preference to the affordable LIHTC only unit. For the replacement unit, that preference will remain in place for five years. Um, once it's, it's constructed. Um, and for the LIHTC units, that first preference remains in place for the first lease up. Um, just to note that this policy that, that's being uh, put forth is uh, um, exceeds the HUD standards that are put in, uh, that are in the CNI program. Um, 
and so uh, that's pretty good. Um, and staff, we do recommend that the, the board approve this resolution. Any questions? Uh, hi, Steve, it's Suzanne. I have a, guess a comment. Um, first, I'm delighted to see this. Um, I think that uh, memorializing um, this does put some uh, meat on the bones of what we've been, I think, trying to say all along. Um, my concern, and this is just is a challenge for all of us, is that I know that I see here that one of the disqualifying events for this preference um, is eviction or the uh, being, you know, part of a stipulation agreement facing eviction, which I think makes our efforts to work with Tidewater Garden residents during this moratorium even more critical. I mean, because the way I see this, if a moratorium lifts and we have to begin to evict folks, they lose this, they lose this significant um, benefit. So I think it just makes our work in trying to explain all that to the residents uh, more critical. Thank you, Keena. Uh, I missed that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say absolutely concur, um, and that is that is correct. Uh, eviction is a disqualifier. Um, uh, urban strategies, uh, which are working with the residents, they have working with uh, the authority in the city. They've actually established some um, eviction protocols, uh, essentially to to um, address those issues. So I agree with you, Suzanne. The, the critical thing is that there's a number of families, um, and there are lots of uh, uh, I'd say. Um, you know, uh, uh, red flag items that come up where USI and authority staff are able to work with those families. I, I don't know if it will prevent all eviction. Um, in some cases, um, you know, the, you know, residents, you know, do get evicted for, for various things um, that uh, one way, no matter how much work we do with them, they, they still seem to go down that path. But yeah. other than that, I absolutely concur. It's a critical time for us to work with the families, and USI is doing that. Thank you. Can, is there a timeline to this, Steve? I'm sorry, say that is one more time. Is there a deadline to this? A deadline for the return policy, as in to, to get it approved? Um, You're doing um, certainly. Oh, uh, uh, I mean, we are. Uh, getting it in place now, um, and you know, as we anticipate starting construction next year, and then lease up in uh, another within a, within two years, that uh, um, we certainly want to have it um, in place through that for that process. Okay, I, I'm asking because I think Suzanne brings up a good point, and I do have questions of the return. Like, if we could bulletproof this, could we pass this by for this meeting? and work through the HCB and Suzanne and, and others to make sure that this is exactly what we want it to be. Because I hear what you're saying about USI and the return on evictions, but I've also seen letters in the community right now from the property manager, the new director of property management that don't, it, the language in those letters don't correlate with what you're saying in this resolution. So I would like to make sure that all of that is like cohesive so we won't have that situation come up. When it comes to evictions and it's this finite detail, let's just put it in this, what we have right now in this resolution to have it on record. Okay. So if I have to make a motion, I would like to make a motion that we we put this off to the next board meeting. Yeah. And is it right 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 Oh, it does. Okay, that's fine. I was going to say if it doesn't require a motion, that's fine. But if it requires, I, I couldn't hear all of Mr. Dillard's comments. But am I understanding correctly that? Um, you want more specificity with regard to <laughs> USI and an OHA property manager's work on, with residents? Right. And so you would like to table this resolution for one month? Yes. Yeah. There's no need for a motion. We can, if, okay. if the board and the chair is agreeable to changing the agenda, we can just move. Forward. <laughs> Does anybody object to tabling the resolution for one month? No, I'll go one step further. Uh, uh, as I'm looking at it, uh, I've already seen two seriously uh, problematic things in the return policy for me. So I'm all for uh, putting it all out. I mean, I've seen two very serious uh, issues for me. 
the housing voice voucher committee. Yeah. So review. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Alfonso, you're welcome to attend the housing choice voucher committee meeting. <laughs> we welcome you. It's an invitation. Does that make it a public meeting? It's a public meeting. Anyway. Okay. Anyway. And if you need to comply, I mean, if you drop paper on the ground outside, you're not leaving compliant. Oh, no. So anything can be used if you have. Uh, well, again, I, the, the key is uh, there are. Some, we want to make sure that we have an answer for the nine thousand questions that are going to come up, not just from us, but from residents, from litigants, from everybody who's got their own narrative about what's going on here. Yeah, the point I was making uh, uh, for Delphine Thick is for me this issue we can't be debated. So we have to be very specific about right. the expectations of the residents. And when we just use a term like lease compliant, well, again, it, may, it may take some more, yeah. you know, what that means. Yeah, that kind yeah. Of stuff. yeah. So, yeah, I, I think a month. I'm going what Delphina said too, like her letter that she had to put out in the community. We can capture all of that in this resolution. That's right. It helps that's right. communication. That's right. Support and the best information that's out there. Okay. We can pull it through. All right. Well, let's 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 have the committee do its work. So we will table this issue of until the Oct until the October meeting. Okay. It's good work, Steve. We just want uh, more of it. <laughs> the reward for good work. No problem. Good work. Thanks, Steve. If I could, I'd, I'd actually like to make one more comment, and this has nothing to do with the uh, return criteria. I just wanted to update the board. We did put in the packet uh, a board update regarding community engagement, um, and those sessions were held last week. Um, yeah. uh, but m more importantly, we are getting a very good response online, um, as well as uh, um, um, even in, in person, some, some uh, surveys turned in. So one, a big big kudos to the city and NRHA team that worked on getting the word out. There was a good piece on channel 13 last night. Um, this is for yeah. the community engagement for blocks 17 and 18. So uh, again, um, just really a kudos to everybody who worked on that. And, and I think we're gonna have some really good responses back. So I just wanted to do a quick update to the board on that because we did have that in the packet. Thanks. Thank you. All right, and let's go ahead and look at um, there's nothing else. Uh, page 38, which is the finance issues. Did I look at did I miss one? Oh, any comments on the development activities report? Michael, did you have anything? Okay, now we're good. All right. Then uh, page thirty-eight. Um, request for proposals, cash advances. Receivable, Virginia. Anything you got? Anything for us? Anything? Um, you know, the money's um, the money's um, coming in. Uh, we had a little challenge with the jobs plus money. Um, a re we were pending a reprogramming. That reprogramming has since been approved and is in locks. And our accounting staff is in the process of drawing down that five hundred and twenty-four thousand. So we're well um, under our four million dollar authorization for cash ad cash advances. But I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Anything? Uh, just to give you a quick update, there was some concern uh, last month when we had to write off some advances that we had made. And uh, we were talked to Virginia. Alfonso and I actually met with uh, James Rogers and uh, Greg Patrick, I think is his mm -hmm. name, to talk about A, uh, moving forward, how do we uh, become a little more systematic in a what we're advancing the money for and 
what is the risk or the opportunity for to be paid back. Uh, so the city agreed to put together some language that they thought, you know, what do you call an MOU or a contract or whatever moving forward, and they're going to send that to us to be reviewed by our council so that we understand in the future that if they say, we want you to advance the money for this, we're going to pay it back, and here's the accounting number where the money is, or we want you to advance the money and wink, wink, we'll pay you back someday. We have a determination of whether we want to take that risk on or not. So that's moving forward. Uh, on the other end, there is uh, quite a bit of money that's still outstanding. Uh, and the agreement that we have with the city is that Virginia and Greg Patrick are going to sit down and go through each one of the items uh, to make sure that there's an understanding of uh, how and when and if those things are going to be paid back. Don, is that, be, is that beyond what we wrote off last month? Yes, there's okay. about uh, an ish, around $2 million still still out there. And so just going, wanting to make sure that both parties understand what each other can, you know, some of these the city has said we can't pay you, and you know we need to have a better understanding of the risk as we obviously as we move forward. And then what is the risk for this money that's still outstanding? He acknowledged uh, at least a million and a half, I think, that he, but the million one that he said there was no dispute about. Uh, there was a number. Yeah. yeah, I know it was over a million. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. But again, that's what Virginia and uh, Mr. Patrick are going to work out. Hassle out. That's why Virginia gets the extra dollars. Well, that's great, a million one, but let's put it No, no, I, well, I mean, I don't know that that's the price. We, I think we're, it was a big gap because I think you mentioned another three million about us. Yeah. And, and, and he was saying, well, I know there's this. And I, I, could, I could be totally wrong about I know it's over a million, but. But he said they could talk through the other stuff. And, and a part of it was, I think, Don, help me if I'm wrong, but I think a part of it was some of the costs that we qualified as necessary to deliver various uh, programs, uh, I think, may have been disputable. I think, yeah, kind of what he was saying, some of the administrative costs associated with some programs, some things like that. Uh, I think it's what uh, that's a piece of it. That's not all of it, but 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 uh, he did acknowledge, you know, uh, some money. Well, I think it's great that you put it on the table, yeah. and then we're going to work on a process, and we're just not going to roll over uh, and play dead yeah. and wait wait a whole lot anymore. Yeah. And again, in in the past, the lack of these M what I call an MOU. I, I mean, I'm sure there's a different name for it, but a clear understanding other than uh, a handshake in the past, which, which worked for a lot, many, many years. And now we just, we need something a little more systematic. So, Very good. But that's just to let you know that, that we, we, we heard you and we, Alfonso and I have been working great with the city. Yes, Ro? Um, I don't know if you sound crazy, but uh, if they owe a million or two million, they got land, why don't just, to give you the land, and if they owe that much money, say, "Well, we give you this property and that'll sell." You got money too. Uh, I think as soon as you become one more than half a council, <laughs> you can make that happen. <laughs> and again, I think part of this, and there's there's a realism uh, that COVID has hit the city just like it's hit us. It's hit everybody else. So while we understand that, we still want a better understanding of this amount. And then what do we do when we move in the future? But we, we can certain that can I'm sure Virginia heard heard you and she can put that on the table if that's what we got going. Uh, any other anything else for Virginia on the finance? All right, thank you, Virginia. Thank you so much. And um, I'll bring an update to the budget and finance yeah. committee as we work with um, Greg in the city on those receivables. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess 
Kim? They're lurking. It, it, it's, it's way too early to start this process. <laughs> I mean, because it says 11 and it's only 10 to this, so this, is, this is just an overview right. to okay. you as the board as to what we should anticipate for 11 o'clock. Okay, great. Um, so we're not going to go through the full PowerPoint presentation and where are my Southern manners? Good morning, everyone. Uh, we will not go through the full PowerPoint presentation. We will defer that and hold that off until 11. But just to talk through the process for the sake of the board meeting, we will convene our public hearing today um, for the annual and five-year plan for Norfolk Redevelopment and Housing Authority. This will take us, this plan will take us through June, we think, June 2025. That asterisk is because we've actually, because of the delay in the waiver that was issued by HUD for the annual plan process, we would normally submit the annual plan in April. It would become effective July 1st. Since we did not submit the annual plan in April of this year, our current plan, the plan that was approved last year, last July, is actually going to play out until December of this year. The plan that we are reviewing today will actually become into effect on January 1st, 2021. So it has shifted the um, period by which our annual plan will cover. Not every housing authority has the same coverage date. So we, Norfolk was one that was July 1st to June 30th of each year as the annual plan period will now shift to a full calendar year, January 1st, hopefully through December 31st. So the end date on this plan for the five year portion may take us through actually December 2025. We're waiting on more details from HUD to specify on the five year plan side how long this will be enacted. Um, just a few things to call out and point out in this process, which makes a little unique. Again, it is a virtual public hearing where we will solicit comments from the uh, callers who call in. We will have, uh, we have had since July 27th, a um, method by which residents and citizens could submit comments to me directly through email, as well as a dedicated phone line to receive uh, recorded comments to be include, included in the plan. As of today, I have not received any emails and we have not received any calls on the dedicated call line. So it will be interesting to see what the public hearing, the voice portion of the public hearing today yields to us and the public comment period will remain open until the close of business tomorrow. Uh, September the 11th. That gives us about 47 days technically. We always add in a couple of days extra, but we will continue to receive comments through to the close of business tomorrow. It is important to point out that again, this is both an annual and a five year plan, which means this plan needs to be inclusive of anything that we aspire to do as an organization over the next five years. This is something that I have been working with staff a lot to massage the understanding that if it's not included in our annual and five year plan, we can not approach it without issuing a significant amendment. And significant amendments have become a little more challenging in the last couple of years. It still requires the same process of public hearing, going to the resident advisory board, convening a public meeting, et cetera, et cetera. But we have seen that our field office has been a little less than responsive to our public, our uh, significant amendments. So I am trying to pack this plan with as much as I possibly can um, in this first and initial go around. If there are some inevitable things that happen that we have to switch it up or update certain policies, then of course we do that. But for the sake of working with staff, I have impressed upon them that we need to put any and everything in this plan that we have an inkling that we want to accomplish. Yes, sir. Kim, as an example, we're talking about potentially repositioning this building right. in 2026 or something like that. Is that the type of thing that needs to be in an annual plan? And then we're, we're way ahead, so we're not right. behind on that one, but next year, should we be putting that in an annual plan? So we can talk about it as being something that we intend to do as a business practice. It's more of a business practice and not necessarily a uh, something that has to be part of this annual plan because it doesn't directly relate to the residents that we serve. Okay, so this is more policy oriented this is right. as opposed to business. Yes, so Thank this you. would be a, our policy document. I give the example, there's a portion of the annual plan that talks specifically about the capital fund money. 
And um, in capital fund, we look at individual uh, communities and what we propose we're gonna do in the community. So we need to know the minutia in terms of how much it's gonna cost. But in the plan overall, we may just come up with a inflated number. But it's best for us to have an inflated number than no number at all. Okay. Yes. Um, so at 11 o'clock, we will begin the public hearing process. Um, again, I'm just anxious. I'm more, it's like, a, like, I feel like this is my first day of school, but I'm so anxious just to see how this process is going to work. Um, because I think with or without COVID, it's time for us to even look at some alternative methods of convening these types of meetings and how we communicate and engage with our constituents. So if there are any, yes, ma'am. So along those lines, Kim, uh, the process, I guess, of the public hearing, the bones is still the same as before. Whoever kind of calls in or makes comments, identifies themselves, gives a, an address, yes. you know, because that's part of the public record that we yes. have, you know. And then we had this conversation before, um, and I see it noted in your excellent briefing, um, that should, should there be um, Issues raised that, that are just inaccurate. Yes. Um, that we will have the ability to correct or clarify those issues. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Now and that you know through our chair and then directing through staff or whatever. Yes. Thank so the in the um, slide that we'll actually go through at eleven, there actually is a slide that talks about order of events in that the board will be assembled to hear public comments and reactions. Um, but dialogue, um, your dialogue and comments will only occur if you feel that a comment is erroneously false, misleading, or otherwise harmful to today's proceedings or the mission of the agency. I know in years past there have been some things that were said during the public comment period. We did not correct them in the moment that they were said, and it kind of snowballed into bigger issues as we went along. So uh, with the under the advisement of um, the chairperson of your board um, of this commission, we have agreed that if there are statements or comments or reactions that are made that just need to be corrected to purify and preserve the sanctity of what we're trying to do as an agency that as board members, you will have the ability to do so. And that's actually uh, whatever it is. Yeah, I see it on the 52. Yeah. Uh, on the slide. Yeah. No, then that it'll it'll be read to the folks. Yes. Slide. yes. Thank you. So we will have the transcriptionist who will come in and transcribe all of the public comments today. We'll also, if there are any comments that are received via email or on the phone line, those comments will also be transcribed as part of the annual plan process. The submission we then I then I then go back to those comments and try to provide an answer um, as it relates to the actual plan itself. In some cases we get, you know, those one offs that's and my light bulb isn't fixed outside of my door, that kind of thing. So we have blanket answers that basically said that we will as an agency address all maintenance issues, et cetera. Um, but what we are looking for today are comments specifically around this, this document and hopefully um, we can maintain the integrity of the process and have folks who actually comment based on the, what the document has or doesn't have. Um, and that also gives us enough time to fix anything, go back, reconfigure, recalibrate, as this document is not due to be submitted to HUD until October 18th, um, which is basically 75 days before January 1st, the date that it's expected to go into action. Okay, any further questions, comments? Well, thank you, Ken. All right, thank you. So, Don, do we have time to get an update on our process regarding uh, delinquent uh, tenant payments and what we discussed the last meeting? Can we get feedback from Don Wells on that? I, I think so. Don, are you there? Been working with the property manager staff since the last meeting um, and they have put forth more of an effort in communicating with the residents 
But Brian, if you can give more specifics to the commissioners, please. Oh uh, yes, good morning. How's everyone doing? Um, like Donna morning. said, uh, uh, we are um, uh, putting forth more efforts. The the, the managers are actually will be knocking on doors. Um, again, you know, we know that sending letters. Um, we, you know, we've been sending letters over the past several months. Um, getting residents to come in to talk about their delinquent wins and where they are. Um, also, um, we're getting the resident services coordinators involved and speaking with residents um, if, you know, if they're having any financial issues regarding um, uh, paying their rent. So these are the, these are the efforts that, and, we, these, and these, these will continue to be ongoing efforts um, month in and month out, um, you know, reaching out to the residents. Um, and, and again, you know, we think that knocking on doors, uh, if residents are not available, we're leaving door knockers just to ask them that we visited the, the apartment and um, would they please contact the office to discuss a very important matter, uh, which is regarding their rent. Like I stated, this this will be ongoing. I don't want to be a micromanager here, but are we uh, documenting this level of contact and what would you call it, Don? Uh, well, despite our efforts, we're, we're at a yes. point where that kind of thing. So, again, I think yes. our, our concern is that January 2nd, there will be a big push of back from people who, if you couldn't pay in March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, to have all that come down on you on January is going to be uh, very disheartening. So what what our concern is, we want to be able to say that we took every possible effort that's available, either through help with the person, working with them on repayment plans and all of that, before we get to the point where we have to say, you got to go. And Deshaun made that point yesterday on TV. I saw her. And uh, she was saying how, is it Deshaun? Am I? Yeah. Deshaun. Deshaun, Deshaun yeah. She made that point on TV yesterday that uh, even though we had, she was talking about a fund to help people with their rent, but she was also saying that they want people to know you're responsible for your rent. This thing is going to come due at some point. Well, that's part of the communication strategy, just yeah. exactly what you're yeah. talking about. But So people don't forget, confuse forgiveness with this putting it off or stalling. So this isn't forgiveness. This means you owe it to me, but you don't owe it to me right now. But I can tell you the-, the There's abuse to people who have the money yeah, now. But, but again, even if I don't have the money, yeah. th this is going to be really something in January. That's right. So again, we need to make sure that we take in every effort yeah, yeah. to find avenues to avoid this but I think there are going to be those situations where, despite everything, uh, we're going to have to have some eviction. Yes, Rose. Um, I think also to cover okay, our, to cover NRJ back, um, when the managers go out, uh, um, whatever contact they make with the person, I think they should have a list in the front of their folder and check it off, and so that whenever it comes back. You could say, well, we did this, yes. we did that, and on this day and right. this time, so we can cover ourselves too. That's what so, okay, so if I if I may, if I may, we have cre we have created uh, such a checklist. I uh, would a manager right. would a manager will be documenting their efforts um, with regards to any communication with the residents and the efforts that we take. So we will have that as as documentation. Of the efforts that we that we are attempting, that's great. And, and this effort just gets amplified because the stakes are so high yeah. for the St. Paul's mm -hmm. um, quadrant folks. I mean, if they get behind in this rent and they're they're evicted, they're facing. I mean, as long as they're on a payment plan or keeping up with the payment plan, they'll be all right. But they start, you know, this eviction process, they lose all the benefits of of that guaranteed return. I mean, and, and no matter, I mean, that, that, that would be tragic 
be tragic for them, it would be tragic for us, tragic for the community as a whole. So I have a much greater sense of urgency uh, around trying to do everything we can to get folks caught up. I mean, even if we have to incentivize it in some way, because if we weigh the cost of eviction compared to Incentivizing it, maybe it's a discount or something. You're right, Rob. Right. To get and, and that's going to cost. You got to be careful about moral hazard on that. Yeah. You got to. You can never put that in writing. You got to handle that one on one. But but. Uh, it, if I can interject, um, this is Donna. So I just want to make a couple comments. So to Suzanne's comment, uh, we are working very closely with USI as it relates to the Tidewater Gardens residents. We have stated uh, since all of this occurred that we are going to allow long-term repayment agreements. Um, and so USI gets a report every time we do the age receivables report from finance that they are well aware of all the residents in Tidewater Gardens who have delinquency concerns. And they're reaching out to them uh, along with the staff to make sure that we're one, finding out the situation with the family and doing whatever we can to assist them. So we are putting forth as much effort as we can to work with the families. This is also being done in the other communities. It's just being done by the manager and the resident service specialist in those communities. Uh, but we have USI assisting us in Tidewater Gardens with that. Um, we are seeing for the month of August, we did see kind of the leveling off of the delinquency amount. Uh, it's been growing every month. It's still not where we want it to be. It's high, but it's kind of leveled off from July to August. So we're hoping that uh, we're going to start seeing that level off and, and start to decline. Uh, but I'll have a better idea when we get the numbers for September and can share that with you next month. All righty. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, let's go on then to new business. Is there any new business? I, I have a comment. I'd like to ask Donna. Uh, well, I guess I'm better to ask the board chair. And, and Donna, I'd like your thoughts on, is there, is there a possibility of getting a uh, briefing or an update from our staff, Donna particularly and her team, on the, the USI NIHA relationship, lessons learned, any good, bad, and ugly, just not bring a USI in, but just having the staff share with us, you know, the things that they, what that relationship has been like. Is that out of school? Is that something for me? No, I, I think uh, Donna, let, let's talk about that, exactly what that's going to look like. I mean, I know it'll be a couple months from now, but yeah, no, that's uh, fine. No, no, no. Donna, what do you think of you? If you prefer not yeah. to, I'll, I'll you know, I'll just. No, that, let you. No. Yes, we can definitely do that. We have been working with USI because they have uh, started drafting a, a report mechanism so that they can share uh, where they're at um, since they started efforts in the community. But we can definitely work to put something together possibly even by October, but let me check with some staff and see if that will be doable. If not, we'll do it in November. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, the, the impetus for the question wasn't to get a report on what they were doing, but to get a right. sort of a understanding of what you feel about what they're doing. Right. It, it, I, I was going to do both, Alfonso. Okay. <laughs> All right. uh, any new business? Uh, then we'll move on to the committee reports. Any any comments on those, folks? BCB was meeting on Tuesday, but after we talked about the resolution, I know it's just in our ceremonial. I still think we're going to utilize it, so we're going to switch that date. Okay. Donna's working with her staff to see which date that's going to be. Okay. It's already a public meeting, so if you guys want to call it and weigh in as well, we'll make sure that you get that information. Okay, great. great. Housing and safety? I think I exhausted everything about it, Don, unless you wanted to add something about the meeting. I, I don't know if you heard me, but I just, I kind of preempted this agenda and started talking about our meeting last Friday. So uh, I just shared with them that uh, 
my, my concern was trying to get the community to uh, be a third stakeholder. I did talk to Suzanne and Joe, I mean, Su uh, yeah, Suzanne and Joe about uh, what I shared I would. Reaching Suzanne as the co-chair of safety and uh, asking Joe to uh, help me put that message in the community, Donna. And, uh, and they both were very, very receptive to what I had to say. And I think we, we can shape your strategy around us going in there. And I agree with everything you said, Mr. Albert. Um, you know, we're working internally trying to figure out best practices in dealing with some of the issues that have been brought up. Uh, so the meeting with Mr. Albert last week I thought was very helpful uh, and it gives us some better direction on ways to move forward in addressing some of the safety concerns. Um, so other than that, I think the minutes for the committee meeting, there was some updates in there on the Digstown construction schedule. So I just want to highlight those. If you get a chance to look at those, it'll give you an update on where we're at with the schedule out there. Yeah, thank you, Donna. Uh, Joe, you had yeah. something? And I, um, I don't want this to be misconstrued because crime is crime. Uh, I think Alfonso and Suzanne do a great job on that committee. Um, but we possibly, in the next future months, segregate it though and show which residents, when we're talking about crime, I would like to know the percentage of residents involved in the crime. If we're talking about someone who's an outsider versus non residents. Okay. It gives us more clarity than that. Even when we're talking the about messaging, it gives us yeah. more clarity. Than That's right. And help us to focus like a laser on the right area. Donna, can you work with uh, Karen Rose on that? Yes, sir. Trying to let us know, differentiate between residential involvement versus non residential involvement. Because I think Karen has done that some. Yeah, but, she has. But, you know, a, a really nice report over the last I'll several months. I think one of our emails, she says, she says it. She yeah. says this is not a resident, just more the data as far right. as the totality of Okay. Yeah, okay. we can and, definitely okay. pull that together. Thanks, Doug. And then the Budget and Finance Committee? Well, we talked about uh, the, the big issue and, and runs on that, and uh, so we're going to I think more, more to follow on that, that issue. Okay, great. Well, then uh, that seems to be where we are. I, I guess I don't close this meeting. Ms. Carr? Yes, sir, you do. You adjourn the, this part of the meeting, and then we will wait until the 11 a.m. And then do I have to reopen it? Yes, we will formally open it. Just tell me what I got to do. Uh, for right now, if we are done with this particular agenda, then we would adjourn the regular board meeting, and everybody would take a break and not discuss any NRT business until we reconvene. I don't know. About five tails, but we can get right. we have to go through the can you hear me and all that stuff. All right, so based upon that advice, I will call the September Board of Commissioner meeting to a close. Thank you very much.